All right, let's do this. Let's do it. Bah. Ah. Hey there, and welcome. To- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are we good? Everyone's got it out? I think we're good. Mauricio, you want to do one? What? What do you want me to do? I started talking and both Jay and AJ went, ah! I'm a, I'm a respectful host. I don't want to... All right. Welcome to Drunk Real Estate. Grab a drink and enjoy the show. Hey there, and welcome to episode 39 of Drunk Real Estate. I am Kyle Wilson, Ashley's Wilson's, Ashley's Wilson's, Ashley Wilson's husband. And I am joined once again by my threesome over here, three co-hosts, starting with Mr. J. Scott. How's it going? I am doing well. You called on me first again. I know Mauricio's pissed. Yeah, I know. I was like, what the, what's going on here? Like, what do we need to do to get, AJ, what do I need, what do you and I need to do to get called on first? You need to join the feed before Jay, so it doesn't look like Jay's before you. Jay starts the feed. It's a little hard to. Yeah, that's going to be tough to beat him. <laughs> that's not. That's not the way this platform works. You can actually join before the host. Hey, I I want to know because I let's just be honest. <laughs> I've never been. Actually, shout out shout out to AJ. AJ joined fifteen minutes early for this podcast. I know it's a first because I came in last, and um... I was confused on the time. So um, <laughs> there is that, but. <laughs> No, we appreciate it. But Jay, how's it going, buddy? Everything is going well. Um, it's going to be a fun night. We've got a lot of good stuff to talk about. Can we, can, we, can we see you drinking finally again this week? So I needed some caffeine for this one because this, this I knew was going to be a- Oh, my a, God. A, I'm not going first. So I need- But stop. Caffeine, but added to my coffee is some Kahlua. So I am drinking- but I'm drinking. Was that on sale at Co- Was that on sale at Costco for five? For no, I almost brought out the uh, the the Kirkland Irish Cream just for you, Mauricio. But I really wanted the Kahlua instead. Judges, Mauricio, are we gonna allow it? <laughs> the Starbucks cup. I actually have that Starbucks cup. Uh, I mean, what, I don't have a choice. It's not like I can go smack him on the head or anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll allow it. Well, Mauricio, how's it going over there? I'm pot man. I got uh got my new book ready to go. Legal strategy Woo! for everyone. But uh, pumped about that. But um, I'm good. I'm also drinking one of my favorite white wines. Uh, this whole thing went to shit in a handbasket because I, I was using my Corbin to open my Farniente Chardonnay, which is a great little white wine. And I'm like, I'm going to use the Corbin because I don't want to drink this whole thing. And then I brought this to the office and it ran out of <laughs> gas. <laughs> so these things have a little pellet of gas and every so often they... They run out and uh, I ran out and I don't have a, I don't have a replacement. So anyway, I had to open the bottle. There's no way I'm drinking the whole thing, but uh, I'm excited about today's episode. I'm a little disappointed. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Farniente, Nickel, Nickel, but their reds are so much better than their whites. Yeah. They're also five times more expensive. That's true, but hey, it's worth it. Not everybody's as loaded and like gangster rich as you are, Jay. Not everybody, <laughs> not everybody has sold m- millions and millions of books that they hang on their wall back there that they can afford free wine. You know, I, I work for my. Speaking of gangster rich, how's it uh, how's it going, AJ? <laughs> <laughs> when you guys start buying your clothes at Costco, you'll be rich to buy wine too. <laughs> how's it going, man? Going good. Just chilling here with my. Fountain, red cup, red Dead solo cup. cup. It's you and Ernie hanging out. That's right, me and Ernie. I feel like when there's a pretty low energy introduction, let's just jump in. What are you drinking, Kyle? I I'm boring today. I went back with a clear. You know, su- support the cause. Um, my computer broke, so uh, I got to go pick it up tonight. I could. I was trying to get them to finish it before the podcast, but so I got to stay relatively sober so i'm just doing the a single single clear can that's it i can tell your 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 feed your your internet feed's pretty crappy is that because you have another computer running oh this computer is like 11 years old so <laughs> it's uh, hopefully riverside does its magic and and fixes it all in post all right let's get into some into some news now uh we might as well start off with the big news of the week since it's been kind of beat over the head by us um we discussed NAR in an earlier podcast uh, the but the new topic of the week is the NAR settlement. It's become such a big news topic that we basically are forced to talk about it again. NAR has agreed to pay 
418 million in damages to settle claims of unfair practices regarding realtor commissions. Uh, there's been a huge debate online going back and forth on how this is going to change home buying and selling landscape, if it's going to change commissions, if at all. For instance, Jay, I think you already showed us a letter that your wife received as an agent from her local chapter about how they're going to make changes. But uh, by some estimates, real estate commissions are expected to fall 25 to 50%, according to TD Cowan Insights. But uh, since we have a lawyer on this call, Mauricio, why don't you give us a little uh, legal perspective on what's going on here? That's why I had to fight for this intro because I'm like, I got to do a legal angle because otherwise Jay's going to take it. He's, he's going to go first as always. But I figured let's put a little, everybody's been talking about it. Let's just kind of put a little legal framework on it. Uh, and just a way of background, as you guys know, we did talk about this uh, in a few episodes ago, but the NAR, which is the National Association of Realtors, is a pretty powerful trade group, right? It's got a bunch of members and owns the trademark realtor, which I, I actually did not know uh, back when we did the last episode. But they have, a, I think, about a million, million and a half members. Uh, and they also have some pretty, pretty big influence over the MLS, the multiple listing services, which is also a big piece of this. And several homeowners had sued NAR. I think it was last year, the year before, about sort of what they were alleging these unfair uh, practices that they were doing, the, the idea that they were basically they felt were forcing uh, sellers to pay for both the seller's agent and the buyer's agent, which is customarily about five or six percent. And they all felt that this was really primarily as a result of NAR's policies of how people had to list on the MLS. And it just kind of became a practice which artificially you know, kept all these prices up. And so there's this huge lawsuit that, that came from uh, several homeowners, not only against NAR, but also some other uh, brokerage houses. And uh, most of them settled at some point and NAR decided to continue fighting the, the good fight. And that led to this lawsuit, which we, we talked about last time. There was a lawsuit that finally was a judgment actually against NAR for $1.8 billion. That's kind of was the topic of our discussion uh, last time. But it also had the potential to get triple damages because it was an antitrust uh, situation. And so they, they had the potential to go up to like $5 billion. And so ultimately, uh, I think based on that, um, NAR decided to saddle these claims for, like you mentioned, California, 18, oh, $418 million. Um, basically, the settlement required, basically, the settlement came out and said they no longer are requiring uh, brokers use the uh, MLS uh, to list the sellers, uh, the buyer's commission. So the way it works right now, as you guys know, the sellers list their property on MLS and they actually invite or basically place on the MLS the, what, what they're willing to pay for the brokers, uh, for the buyer's commission. And there's really no arrangement right now between the buyer, no legal contract between the buyer and the buyer's agent. It's basically all handed from the seller. So if you're the seller, you're thinking, well, this is kind of unfair. I'm actually going to be paying for the buyer's agent who's actually, his job is to negotiate against me, but somehow I got to get stuck with that. So they agreed that they were no longer do that. They were going to require home buyers to enter into these contracts with the, the buyer's agents. And now there's going to be a formal contract. And the idea is they're going to have to negotiate whatever they're going to negotiate in terms of what they're going to get paid for that. Um, and uh, the implication to this, or sort of the consequence of this is that this kind of traditional 6% model, the 3% plus 3%, 3% to buyer, 3% to seller's agent is basically that model is gone. At least that's what we all think is going to happen. Uh, and so a lot of people are thinking that this is really a just a sort of a, 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 a major break in the model that's going to change the entire way that things are, are being done in, in the residential real estate business. It still has to be approved by the judge. Uh, this hasn't taken into effect. In fact, even if it does get approved, it's not going to take effect till July, uh, mid-July of this year. But some people are basically arguing, hey, this is going to destroy the current, uh, the current uh, business model. It's going to allow some of these e-buyers to come in that have been kind of at a competitive disadvantage. People looking like discount brokers, almost like the Uber model to the, the taxi cab drivers. Um, and then I've heard other people say that it's really not a big deal, uh, which I'm really interested in your guys' take. I had uh, our, our good friend Neil Bauer on the show uh, early this week, and he was like, this is going to change the whole thing. Uh, we're going to see probably half of the agents quit uh, because, uh, you know, they're just not going to be able to sustain this model and you're going to see commissions go down to as much as 50%. So instead of having to pay, you know, 6% uh, to sell your home, you may only have to pay two or 3%. And then that's also going to obviously increase the argument goes, uh, the, the price that a buyer has to come. If you're a first time home buyer, now you actually have to come up with the money to, uh, pay your buyer's agent to help you buy that first home or whatever home it is. I've already heard lenders talking about some method where, you know, maybe we'll treat this kind of like some of this PMI insurance and we'll actually let you finance whatever the cost of this buyer's agent. So if suddenly the buyers have to pay two or 3% to the buyer's agent and pay, 
twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. That's something that might be able to include in the loan. But I am definitely interested in figuring out what your guys' take on. One thing I will lead you with, because I was thinking about this through the weekend, because uh, some people think obviously that some of these agents are grossly overpaid, that all the crappy ones are going to quit. We're only going to keep the big ones. But here's one thing I do know when it comes to basic economics. If it's true that half of these realtors are going to quit because they just won't be able to compete, then that by definition is a reduction in the supply of the service. And so basic economics dictates on a supply and demand curve that if the supply of something decreases, only two things can happen, right? Either the cost of something's going to go up or the quality of what you're getting is going to come down. So I'm interested to think to get your guys' take on that. But some people say it's a huge deal. Some people saying, yeah, it was never really, really an obligation to begin with. So it's not going to really affect too much. But I think it's a big deal. I think you are going to see a major shift. I think it's going to really benefit people who have uh, an alternative marketing thing. Because one of the reasons you offer 3% to the buyer's agent is because it's an easy way to get the thing marketed, right? Because if you can incentivize buyers to come in and show, bring their buyers to show your property, it's easier for you to go sell this, your property in the first place. Now, if I'm not paying that person, I'm not going to figure out other ways to get my home in, in front of potential buyers. And that's where I think the creative marketing uh, is going to take into effect. AI technology, I think, is going to have a play in that. And so there's a lot of people that, that suppose they're going to benefit from this. Uh, some of these, like I said, e-buyers that have already used technology and have some discounted brokers. And I've heard CoStar, which is a big player in the commercial, in your guys' space, multifamily commercial space, seems to have a lot of data that they may be able to enter the market and sort of uh, undercut or, or, or compete more efficiently now that this uh, this this model is being broken. But interesting in taking your, your guys' take on this. Yeah, I, would, I would start off by saying... Um... First of all, I hope it does go lead to changes. I've, I think in a previous podcast, I went on a rant on how shitty real estate agents are. I got my license and how easy it is to get your license and how many bad agents there are. So I, I hope this does lead to changes and, and to less crappy agents. But at the same time, I think there's a very good chance that not a lot changes from this. Really, the only thing that it's going into effect is... First of all, you could always negotiate with your buyers and sellers and, and these fees and everything. It was just kind of a, an unwritten rule that this, this happened. And the one major change that came out of it is now um, you're no longer allowed to post on the MLS for a, a, an offer to pay the, the, the buyer's broker commission. So you're not allowed to do that anymore. But it doesn't mean you can't. And so the, the big well, thing you that- can't, you, can't, you can't post on the MLS. So legally, but, but you can still operate. You can't, you can't post on the MLS, but you can still, as a seller, you could still pay the buyer's broker's commission. And here, here's, here's the big kicker to me. First of all, we talked about before NAR's influence. So they're already going to be steering agents when they you know, do their trainings and do all these different uh, things. They're already going to be steering what, they're, what to do. But the big kicker to me is think about someone buying a three hundred thousand dollar house. If you're buying a three hundred thousand dollar house, and let's just say you're you're offering, you're a buyer and you want to offer three hundred thousand dollars. Well, you could either offer three hundred thousand dollars and pay your agent three hundred or nine thousand, or you can offer three hundred nine thousand. But as part of your offer, you say, "Hey, Mister Seller." you're going to pay my $9,000 commission to the to my broker. The seller doesn't care. Either way, he's getting $300,000. On the, on the settlement sheet, it's all going to work out to $300,000. But the big difference is, and Mauricio touched on this about financing that, that amount, is if you offer $309,000 and the house gets sold for $309,000, you can wrap that into your loan you can have basically your broker's commission wrapped into the loan. So that's why I, I think it's, it's still going to become pretty, it, like it's still going to be standard for people going to want sellers to pay their broker's commissions just for, uh, so for the fact that they can put it into their loan and they don't have to come out of pocket with that money. But, but you're going to have to still get that finance though, uh, Kyle, right? You got you to gotta get that thing appraised at 309. And so the lender's only going to lend you whatever they're going to lend you, 80% or 90% of whatever the appraised value is. But it's, been, it, but it's already been happening forever. So, so it's no. not like all of a sudden the appraiser is going to say, oh, well, now that there's this big change, we're going to start appraising houses for less. No, if, pe if things just continue as business as usual right now, it's just instead of offering it, the, the only big difference I see is now these like uh, buyers brokers agreements are going to become a little bit more tight. It used to be very loosey goosey. 
and where you'd like you'd sign sometimes you wouldn't even sign until you actually had an offer and and if you signed and said oh hey mr buyer broker i'm going to pay you three percent but then the the selling agent was only offering two and a half the buyer broker would kind of just be like all right that's good enough and they kind of just like rewrite the contract and get two and a half i think now the buyer's broker agent contract are going to be a lot more tight a lot more important but at the end of the day i think there's a very good chance that business as usual just keeps happening what do you what do you think the buyers I mean, this is a question i also thought about over the weekend because obviously and i think we did touch about this in the last episode of how things have changed over the last even just last like, 10 years that it's been around for the last 20 but back in the old good old days right back in the 80s or something or whatever part of a big part of what the buyer was getting paid for was actually finding these properties for you they'd actually go on the mls they'll go do all this research they go do comp they'll do all this work for you and then they would bring then they go show you these houses or whatever that's all kind of gone away now because obviously like I'm, I'm looking for a piece right now. I, I can just go on any of these places and, and do a search and Google search and find the properties myself. I don't need an agent to go find me a property anymore. The technology now is caught up where I can easily, and it's actually a lot of fun to just start searching about, oh, looking for houses in my neighborhood for this price range and what it looks like. And I, I picture it. I mean, I do the whole thing. And then I can just pick up the phone and say, I'd like to come look at it. And they're like, great, come look at it. Like I don't need the buyer's agent at all for that. What I really need the buyer's agent is once I get in the contract, I need somebody maybe to help me do the contract and then all the all the due diligence and all the pre stuff. But that I can go separately and go for nine thousand dollars. I mean, I can go freaking get an attorney to go do all that paperwork. Like, what what is a buyer's agent? What is the value that a buyer's agent is bringing to me today? Now that I can go on all these services and just search for these things for free and and do this over the weekend with my family and it's a lot of fun checking out all these properties. Well, I, I think today the value is the same because if you were to ask and and just full disclosure, I've been licensed in three states. My wife is a broker here in Florida. Uh, she was a broker in Maryland. Uh, we only do it for ourselves. We don't really represent anybody else unless it's friends or family that, that needs help. Um, but I am familiar with the process. And so knowing lots of real estate agents on the buyer side, the thing that agents hate the most, and, and this isn't a secret, I think everybody would, would guess this, is the showing potential buyers um, houses. So spending a month or three months or six months taking potential buyers, shopping for houses, maybe putting in some offers, not getting anything. And then potentially at the end of that six months, that buyer decides, okay, this market isn't good for me or I can't find the house I want. They don't buy anything and the agent doesn't get paid. And so now they just wasted literally months of their time and they don't get paid. What I suspect is going to happen is that part of the business, just as you insinuated, Mauricio, that part of the business where buyer's agents are showing buyer's houses is going to go away. And the real value for buyer's agents is going to be as what's currently called a transaction coordinator. So somebody whose job it is to represent the buyer, maybe represent, maybe not represent, maybe maybe just help. Um, there, there's a couple of ways to do it. But in, in some respects, represent the buyer, uh, help them negotiate, help them prepare the paperwork help them deal with financing, help them deal with the title company, title search, get everything closed, make sure that they show up where they need to show up to on time, make sure they sign the things that they're supposed to sign, answer questions when the buyer has questions. All of those things still have value for a buyer's agent. But as you said, Mauricio, showing houses is, is one of those things that nobody likes that. Buyer's agents hate doing it. Buyers don't need it. So what I suspect is going to happen is we're going to see that part of the business go away. Buyer's agents are going to become these transaction coordinators, and they're going to start charging a flat fee. And they're going to charge that fee before you get a house under contract. So if I'm going to look for a house and I need an agent, and let's say AJ's a buyer's agent, I'm going to go to AJ and say, I'm planning to buy a house in the next six months. AJ's going to say, great, give me $1,000. When you find the house you want to make an offer on, I'll help you write up the paperwork. When you get it under contract, I'll help you with the financing. I'll help you with the negotiation. I'll help you with um, the, the title company, everything you need help with for that $1,000. And that way, AJ knows that he's basically only doing work um, that he's going to get paid for because he's getting paid up front. He's getting paid a lot less, but his effort is a whole lot less because he's not doing that crappy part of the job up front where he has to show 100 houses. And so that's my take. Um, to take that one step further, um, and this was suggested to me by a friend today, so so credit to him. Um, I could see that whole transaction coordinator piece, basically helping the buyer with all their stuff, merge with the mortgage broker piece of things. So the, the example my friend used today was 
you walk in, excuse me, you walk into a uh, car dealership and most people that walk into a car dealership don't have a bank loan pre-approved. They go in, they find a car they want, they sign the paperwork, and then they deal with getting the loan through the guy that's selling them the car. I can see the same thing happening here in real estate where you go to a buyer's agent and part of the service that buyer's agent offers is that they are your mortgage broker as well. Or maybe it's the other way. They go to the mortgage broker and part of their service is they offer you all that transaction coordination. And so I could see those two merging. And if they merge, it's even better for the agent because not only do they get that upfront fee, let's say a thousand or two thousand dollars, whatever it is, but they're also getting a commission on the mortgage uh, on the on the loan origination as well. And so they're getting paid more, and it's worth it for them to just do that smaller piece. So that's what I see happening in the industry. Let me throw out one more thing. You were talking about somebody saying that uh, we could see fifty percent of agents going away. The reality is forty nine percent of all real estate agents sell zero or one houses per year. 49%, 79%, I'm sorry, 70%, 70% of agents sell fewer than five houses per year. And the average agent sells 12. So that means 50% of agents, let's say the typical house is $400,000 and and, and an agent's getting 3%. The typical or the, the average 50%, 49% of agents in this country are making $12,000 or less a year as a real estate agent. It doesn't surprise me that they are going to go away. The big difference is they're going to recognize now that they're not going to make money and they're going to choose to turn in their license as opposed to what they're doing now, which is they're not doing any deals. They're not making any money, but they're paying NAR, they're paying the MLS, they're paying all these fees every year. They're just going to stop paying those fees. So I, I think that, that, that NAR is screwed. I think the MLS... Uh, the, the individual MLSs are screwed because they're going to lose a whole lot of fees from all these agents who previously were just paying their fees every year in the hopes that they would do some deals. But now they're going to recognize that's not going to happen and they're going to stop paying their fees. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Although then the other thing that I was focusing, I know we focused on the, the I don't know even where the, Kyle, you said 300000 and $9,000. I mean, 300000 is even below the median house in, in, in the US. But like when you're looking at a little bit of higher I mean, look, the average house in my neighborhood is like 1.6 million. It's like, so, so 3% of that is like 48 grand, like 40 to $50,000 to pay for it. Like if I, if, if that's no longer being paid by the seller and I'm like, Hey, Hey guy, you got to pay me 40 or 50 grand and do this work to buy this, this, this average home in my neighborhood. I'm going to be like, is it really worth me paying you 40, 30, 40, 50, 20? Like that, those are big numbers that I can start really literally hiring lawyers. Well, NAR, NAR likes to always say the negotiation piece is so paramount, right? So when you say about, okay, the buyer's agent might go away, NAR has these advertisements all the time where it says, and they put up statistics. I don't know where they get the statistics from, but oh, sellers who are represented by a licensed realtor get 8% more for their houses versus people who don't. And on the other side, buyers pay 8% less than somebody who's not represented by agent. So they, they would argue that the negotiation piece is just as important as anything which is why I, I brought up the point before, like hopefully this, this leads to better agents. So hopefully people start to realize that, okay, I need to get my money's worth and let's, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe Baker Pockets should come up with a book or something about negotiating with real estate. That's probably a good idea. And then at, at bare minimum, like an agent's read a book or two about negotiating, but they should be in tune with what the market prices are, how much this house should go for. Like technically, they should be an expert who's going to help you get the best price for this and more than pay for whatever fees you're paying them. But don't I have AI? Yeah, AJ is probably going to say there's AI for this. <laughs> oh, no. But I was going to say that um, I think for the vast majority, though, of uh, brokers and everything, the incentive is not to get the best price. It is to move product. So it's, you know, when you look at the house, uh, when you look at real estate agents, house flipping, they're way more incentivized. And this is also in commercial real estate, too. It's to move the product because they get paid based upon a transaction. They don't get paid for doing the work. That's not how it works, right? You only get paid if it sells, regardless if you do work or not. So the transaction has to take place. That's why in commercial real estate, lots of brokers have specific people they work with and they won't work with a lot of people because the fear of it not closing and transacting, that's a big problem because that they can lose the deal. Deals fall out of contract and if they don't sell, they're, they're gone. Then the broker did all this work and never got paid for. 
So I think it's important in real estate that regardless of the commissions, regardless of the work that they need to do, if you're getting a real estate agent or you want to be a research, you also need to understand what the actual incentives are for those those brokers. And I found this with even when we were listing our house, I asked everybody where where we should um, sell the house. So I asked six brokers. All of them said you should sell it at 850 to 900,000. And uh, I thought that was interesting because I thought it was worth like 1.2. So we were obviously wildly off and everybody's like, well, you're the homeowner. You always think your home's worth more, right? Um, and then what I found out was in our market, the moment you go from 900,000 to 1.2, the transactions over double in length, time, and three times. And uh, the odds of that house actually transacting and closing goes down substantially once it went over 900,000, right? Well, I found an agent that I said, here's the reasons why I think it's worth 1.2. And I think it is, right? And we listed and we sold it for 1.2. Um, but not one broker would give me that price guidance, but it had everything to do with the fact that it would take them twice as much time to sell it at that price. Twice as much time. And if they sell it for $100,000 less, what's the big deal? They're making $3,000 less. So instead of, instead of making, uh, instead of making 36,000, they're making 33,000. Um, that's, that's an easy math equation in their head. Let's, let's give up the 3000 and get this done in half as much time. Yep. Better for them. Way worse for me. The, the interesting question here. And one of the interesting questions here is because obviously we're real estate investors. We've got a lot of people who are real estate investors that listen to the show. How is this going to impact us as investors? And and I'll, I'll throw out one scenario that I think is, is going to be interesting. So I, I flipped a lot of houses in my career. Um, and a lot of those houses that we bought were purchased um, back in the day off the MLS. They were, they were REO properties. And so we would basically, we, we'd represent, our, represent ourselves as the buyer uh, and then there was a selling agent, a listing agent on the other side that was selling on, on behalf of the bank, um, or in some cases they were selling on behalf of the seller. And one of the ways that we were able to get deals that other people couldn't was we would basically go to the selling agent and say, hey, I know you're listing this property for for a 3% commission split. So so 6%, you get three, we get three as the buyer's agent. Uh, we don't care about our 3% as the buyer's agent. Uh, if we end up buying this house, you get to keep the full 6%. And again, in a just world where the, the, the listing agent is doing their fiduciary responsibility to the seller, um, they're not going to be compelled to convince the seller to, to let us buy it just because the, the agent's going to get 3% more. But in the real world, that worked a lot. We got a lot of agents who basically convinced their sellers to sell to us, them knowing that they were going to get double the commission from it. Well, now in a world where there isn't a buyer's agent commission or the buyer's agent commission is so little that it's not going to move the needle for the listing agent, it does change the, uh, the calculus a little bit for us as, as investors uh, who used to have our, our real estate license simply for the, the benefit of being able to kick our uh, buyer's commission back over to the selling agent. So I, I, I thought that's... that's Theoretically, you're, you're, you're still getting it, you're just able to offer it in your offer, right? Like it, it was one of those things that just, as I said, like on the settlement sheet, it all works out in the end. Now you're just offering, you know, 3% more instead of the agent getting it. No, it, well, it, it, it works out the same for the seller, but it doesn't work out the same for the agent. The agent's literally, the listing agent is literally pocketing twice as much. Yeah, I, I guess I, it, for that agent, it's going to be tough. But like we're when we're talking about like, are these going to change things? Obviously, you can't make that offer anymore. You're not going to be able to say, hey, but if you wanted to, you could say, hey, if you accept this, I don't see why you couldn't say if you accept this, we'll pay you for, you know, a certain amount from our pocket as well. Like, is there is, you know, Mauricio, is there any legal issues to that? I, I don't think there are legal, issue, legal issues to that. Um, but I have a feeling that a seller who's seeing um, a, a kickback, it, it's a lot easier to hide moving the uh, the commission from one side of the, the the settlement statement to the other than it is to see a, a separate line item of the buyer literally just paying money out of pocket to the uh, to the listing agent. I mean, you wouldn't put it on the settlement sheet, but it, it does happen, especially in commercial real estate where- if you're, not putting it on the settlement, if you're not putting it on the settlement sheet, it's not legal, obviously. 
Well, it, it doesn't have to be legal. You just, uh, you, you know, it's a, it's a side agreement. Well, you know, it does, it does have to be legal because you have a fiduciary responsibility to your client, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get anyone or anything in trouble. I just know that in commercial real estate from time to time, um, when you are doing a transaction and, you know, let's say that the, the seller isn't offering a great commission for the, the seller's agent to, to sell their property, then you offer to kick in some money on your side uh, to the seller's agent in order to facilitate the transaction. Yeah. 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 Let's not, let's not uh, uh, encourage that. But um, I guess another question I would have for you guys that I was always thinking about is like, you know, I always, not always, but I, I think of this 3% buyer's commission that is offered by the seller is kind of your marketing fee, right? It's like, like, how do I market this thing? Well, I'm going to offer 3% to the buyer. So the buyer is incentivized to go come show their clients to my property. And that's how I sell my property. Well, if that goes away, that's going to require sellers agent to be more creative and like, well, how am I going to get my, you know, how am I going to compete and get people to come see my product? They're going to have to develop different skills or maybe to some people's point, you know, they may have a little bit of a disadvantage over these e-brokers who are all over the internet. They're marketing experts and they can do this cheaper and better because they have a, a marketing funnel. But it, let's talk about the marketing angle. I mean, what do you guys think about that 3%? I mean, how else do you market your property? Well, well do you think there's going to be a la carte options now? Like, do you think, do you think there's going to be a la carte options where it's like, you know, Hey, we will sell your property. We will do the bare minimum. And that is $10,000. Or if you want the bare minimum plus. Yeah. But, how, but how are you going to attract, how are you, how are you going to attract the buyers? Cause before you were attracting the buyers by offering them a 3% commission. Now you're not offering them 3%. How are you going to attract buyers to come convince buyers to come look to, to, to read your listing and bring their clients to, to see your home? I guess to your point before, we have Zillow, right? The buyers can just look themselves. But then Zillow gets a cut of that. I mean, Zillow's I'm not quite <laughs> Zillow's business model is an enigma in and of itself. But yeah, but but you're still as a buyer. I think a lot of buyers, and, and I, I think here, here's part of the the difficulty here in predicting what's going to happen. Um, it, it's a lot. I it, normally it's a lot easier to say what's going to happen short term than long term. Um, for me, I think it's more clear what's going to happen long term here than what's going to happen short term. Like I can just imagine July 15th or whatever that day is where the settlement's approved and things kick in and July 15th, suddenly I, I my wife or whoever goes on the MLS um, to look at a property and uh, they see that there's no commission split listed on the MLS and that agent picks up the phone and calls the listing agent and says, so how much is your, uh, is your seller willing to pay uh, for the buyer's agent? It seems unlikely that right away things are going to change to the point where that listing agent's going to say, oh, they're not paying anything. That's your responsibility. More likely, they're going to, more likely they're going to say, they're going to have talked to their, their seller and the seller will say, well, yeah, let's still do the 3% because I still want people looking at this property. And so that, that buyer's agent is going to call and the listing agent is going to say, yeah, 3%. Nothing's changed. It's just not on the, the MLS anymore. At what point does somebody get the balls to, to step up and say, nope, my seller is not paying anything. Show the property. Don't show the property. Do what you're going to do. Negotiate that, that, that uh, commission into the offer if you want. Um, but as it stands, it's 0%. Balls in your court. Who's going who's gonna to do that? Yeah, because I think, you know, sell, uh, yeah, sellers, they are going to be reading the headlines like, oh, this is great. Like, I don't have to pay the 3% anymore. So then so they go hire a listing agent and the listing agent can say, hey, it's 6%. And they'll be like, what do you mean it's 6%? This whole NAR, this whole this settlement, it's only supposed, I'm not supposed to be paying for this. And it's 3%. And the listing agent is going to have to address that at that point because they're it's all over the news. It's not like they're going to sneak it by and they're probably going to be talking about it. See, that, that's why I think it's just going to be 3%, though. And when, to your point, Jay, when that person calls the agent, they're just going to say, put it in the offer. Like, they're not going to say, hey, my seller is willing to pay this much. They're just going to say, put it in the offer. Is that, that we, we will cover and you make an offer. And, and then it'll be something that you can negotiate down and be like, hey, we're only going to pay 2.5% of, like, you know, it's like closing costs. Like, something like you, whenever you're trying to reduce the, you know, the, the out of pocket expenses when you're making an offer. Because I I did some did some work for my mm -hmm. my cousin about uh, where they had one of those uh, FHA loans, so they were trying to reduce their their amount as much as they could, and so they'd always say, "Hey, roll in the closing costs. You pay pay the transfer tax. You pay all this stuff. It's just going to become like one of those transactional fees that they can ask the seller to pay." But as as I said, the seller just worries about that net amount that they're getting. 
Well, then let's talk about this from a legal perspective. And I'm glad we have somebody here who uh, who pretends to be a lawyer, even though he uh, he mostly just flies around the world and 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 goes to conferences and doesn't really do much lawyerly stuff anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so no, seriously though, Mauricio, if if I'm a buyer's agent and I have a fiduciary responsibility to my client, doesn't that mean I need to try and get my client the best price? And doesn't that mean that if I convince my client to put even one dollar into the offer, that like basically the seller has to pay me? That's potentially hurting. How much the 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 buyer is going to be able to get a deal on that house, and I'm not doing my fiduciary responsibility by by convincing my buyer to to kick back some money to me. Is is that not legally sound? Yeah. So just so so contrary to popular belief, I am not a real estate attorney, right? So I'm a SEC securities attorney. I, I'll make sure that capital raises stay out of jail. I'm not a real estate transactional attorney. However. Yes, you are right that if there is a fiduciary responsibility between the agent and the client, the broker and the client, really the broker, the broker and the client. And so their obligation is to act in the best interest of their client and to make sure their interest is above and beyond their interest. So if there's ever a conflict between, hey, do I do something and there's a decision to be made? Do I do this thing that does it benefit the buyer or does it benefit me? And if there's a discussion there, it has to benefit the client because they do have that fiduciary responsibility. So when the when the seller says to the 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 buyer's agent or to the buyer, um, I need to net three hundred thousand dollars for this house. If you want to buy it for three twenty and give yourself twenty k, I don't care. If you want to buy it for three ten and give yourself the the agent ten, I don't care. I just need to net three hundred. It would now be against the the buyer's agent's fiduciary responsibility to say anything above three hundred thousand dollars. Well, I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying you're going to have to make sure that, I mean, because maybe the, maybe the client's okay with it and they love it because it's like, do, do, there's no, are there any other offers? No. And so, wow, if I don't do this, I'm not going to sell the house and there's a risk. And so, no, I want, let's take that deal because I think it's in our best interest to do it because if we don't take it, you know, I don't have a buyer and interest rates are going to do this and I might, you know, six months. Blah, blah, blah. So as long as that's all disclosed and there's, but ultimately the standard that you're going to be judged against is, did you do something that's, you know, did you do anything that took your your interest above those of your client. And if that's the case, then there's always that risk of them coming back and, and having a claim against you for breach of fiduciary duties. What else we got? <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing else on legal mumbo jumbo. Do you think here's, here's, let me ask you this though. That the one of one of the things that people have been talking about a lot is, is, is this is going to dramatically not only change the model, obviously, but also reduce the commissions that are being paid out there. And, and there's then the extrapolation that prices are going to go down for some reason, right? That, that that's, that's going to be the net result is that because, you know, buyers are going to need to buy, they don't, they're not going to have the money. So think about it. First time homeowners, I'm going to go buy a piece of property. I'm already stretched because interest rates are high. I barely have the down payment. I got to buy a house for 350 grand. I can barely afford it. I'm, I'm stretching on the mortgage. Now you add another, whatever, $9,000, $10,000 I got to pay for the buyer's agent, which before I didn't, I just can't afford that. I'm going to have to, you know, my, my capacity to pay is is just too high. I got to offer you a lower amount. What do you guys think about that argument? I don't think that's going to, no. I, I don't think we'll see a reduction in real estate prices due to um, lower commissions at all. It's going to go to somebody. Um, but I, if we do, it's not going to be nothing significant. Well, I, I thought that was interesting given that uh, Kyle basically started his thoughts earlier with this is going to push values up. And so I think that's that's part of the nobody has any idea what's going to happen because I, I hear a lot of people credibly arguing that values are going to go down because commissions are going to go down. I hear a very credible ar ar uh, argument from Kyle that values are going to go up. Well, because... no, the values will just stay the same. I don't. I didn't say they're going to go up. They're just going to stay like, yes, you're going to roll it into the offer, but it's already rolled in right now, right? Like the 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 seller is paying the commission. It's just right now the seller is offering 6% to the buyer's agent to to split now he's going to be offering 3% or sorry 3% to the seller's agent and and he's going to and 3% is going to be rolled into the price of the offer as closing costs so i just think it's going to stay exactly the same okay understood understood but there was already a trend of you know the, the, every single news article brings up the 6% right if you look at the average real estate commission across states like there's only i think there's only two states 
that the average is 6%. Every other state is less than that, down all the way to, I think, uh, New York's less than 5% is their average. So like it was already trending that these the 6% was was uh kind of going away and it was it was becoming a a new normal that you know closer to 5 and I just hope it adds to a little bit more creativity for just example like you can look at let's look at commercial real estate as kind of a leading indicator because uh commercial real estate doesn't have that okay the seller's going to pay the buyer's agent. If you're selling an apartment building or a self self storage unit or something you hire a selling agent and you say, we're going to pay you X. You say nothing about the buyer. So it's on that seller's agent in order to determine all of that other back end stuff. Well, if you look at like a seller's agent, a very common thing in commercial real estate is you say, hey, I think my property's worth $30 million. I'm going to give you a 1% commission or a 0.75% commission or something for $30 million. But for every dollar above $30 million, I'm going to give you 2% or I'm going to give you, you know, like you, you, you could tier that and kind of incentivize the, the selling agent in order to do a better job and get more money for you. That's just like an example of creative things that, that, that spurn on from that. And so I'm hoping there's more creativity, whether it's, you know, a la carte options. So a buyer's agent, like I know when we were back, when we were flipping houses, when we were flipping really expensive multi-million dollar houses, like buyer's agents would go into the house and they would literally do like a virtual tour for their buyer because these buyers, they're busy people. They don't want to have to drive all around doing tours. The buyer's agent would go in and they would basically give them a virtual tour and walk them around virtually these houses. There's, there's going to be hopefully these, these better options for buyers and sellers for better agents to do more things for them because they know they're not just getting that tap in three two and a half percent. Well, it's interesting. You you just talked about um, just to, to pick up on one example um, where you give an incentive to, to sell the house for more um, in, in real estate parlance, that's called a net listing um, where basically you say, if, if I can get this much money for my house, um, I'm going to pay this commission. If I get more then some or all of that goes to the, the agent. Uh, NAR actually doesn't allow that. That's against NAR's rule. And, and legally, I think there are only three states that allow it. I think California, Texas, and Florida. And I only know that because I, I have my license in Florida. So I learned this when I, I moved here. Um, only three states allow it. And NAR doesn't allow it for any of its members um, because in theory, it's a conflict of interest um, because it, it's it's giving uh, uh, some mismatched fiduciary incentives. Um, and so it will be interesting to, to that point, Kyle, will NAR change rules around things like net listings and other things that can basically allow us to incentivize agents in ways that we previously couldn't incentivize agents. And so I don't know, again, I'm not an attorney. I don't know if this goes to laws around fiduciary responsibilities and other things, or if if it can just be arbitrarily changed uh, by, by NAR and the states. Um, but I suspect that we're going to see some rules and some laws change that's basically going to allow uh, ways that that agents and, and fiduciaries are, are, are compensated in this business. So AJ and I both said that this isn't going to change housing prices at all. Uh, Jay and then Mauricio, Jay, do you think it's going to change prices at all? I don't think, I put it this way, it, it might, but I don't think it's going to change prices enough that it's going to be measurable. Um, I, I, I Maybe there are people that are a whole lot, well, certainly there are people a whole lot smarter than I am, but maybe there are people a whole lot smarter than I am that can then figure out if prices go down 1.2%, over the next five years, was it, or it goes up 1.2% more slowly than it otherwise would. Maybe there are people smart enough to figure out that that was directly related to this whole commission thing. But I mean, from my perspective, how do you determine that that's the case versus just prices haven't grown as fast or they've gone down a little bit? I don't know. So, so yeah, I, I think the average commissions will absolutely go down over the next couple of years. And I'm going to, uh, I'll go on record as guessing 4% on average, or uh, let me say that again, 2% lower than what it is today. Cause like you said, Kyle, it's not really 6% in most States States I've been in is typically around 5%. I'm, I'm guessing that things are going to go down. Commissions are going to go down on average 2%. 
Um, but I don't know how you you measure if that's going to be from from measure whether that's going to impact prices or not. Mauricio, you think it's going to impact prices? Yeah, I, I don't think it's going. I think it's just going to dramatically uh, change the model. So it's going to be interesting to see what what the model is going to evolve and who's going to be the winners and losers. Um, I know that um, it was one of my questions here, and I'm just looking at the price right now. But I know that when this got announced on Friday, shares of, of Zillow and Compass took a dive about 13 percent. Um, and then I keep hearing like CoStar is somebody that might be a benef benefactor of this rule. But I also heard Zillow might be a benefactor. And I kind of believe more that Zillow would be a benefactor because, you know, again, it's, it's going to create a necessity to be more creative on the marketing. And Zillow has so many great ways because it has such an audience to actually monetize how to buy and sell. And I do feel like uh, they, they could um, they could do it. Now, Zillow has since, since rebounded a little bit, like it got up, you know, ten, yeah, actually up quite a bit actually since since the news. But uh, what do you guys, who, who are the biggest benefactors other than homeowners, I guess, who are sellers, home sellers, do you think there are some companies out there that are just going to crush it now that they're because I kept hearing about these e buyers and whether it's it's CoStar or some of some of these other e actually some of these websites that offer discounted services. Do you think they are now the argument has been that they have been at a dis, uh, competitive disadvantage? The analogy I keep hearing about is this Uber. It's like, hey, just imagine you you had the taxi drivers that had this huge union and they were preventing Uber from from competing. Well, now this is going to take that off the table and now Uber is going to be able to compete with the taxi drivers and they're going to blow them away. The same argument has been extended to these e, e, e websites that sell properties at a, at a discount. Are they now going to be able to flourish to really drive down prices and, and get more technology involved into the, to the system? So somebody that I know pretty well um, who is tied in um, very closely with NAR um, suggested something to me the other day that, that I, it took me a few minutes to think about, but I, I absolutely agree with him. I think the big winner here, um, to some degree winner, um, is going to be companies like Redfin. Um, I think what we're going to see is that companies like Redfin, these, these other, essentially what I was talking about, transaction coordinators on the buyer's side, but at a massive scale, um, are going to start to consolidate and be bought up by some of the very, very large brokerages that recognize that they're going to be losing a lot of money on the buyer side. And the only way that they're going to be able to, to maintain their, their profits and their margins um, is to basically control that transaction coordination piece. And so I, I think you're going to see Redfin getting bought in the next 12 months. Um, and I think a lot of other companies like Redfin, smaller companies like Redfin, are going to consolidate and get bought as well. And so um, is that good for them? I mean, probably good for their shareholders, especially when Redfin's getting crushed over the last I was going to say, like Jay, Jay's making stock recommendations to buy, buy, buy Redfin since it's been hammered here over the last. And they went down uh, on this news. They immediately went down 5%, not as bad as the 13% of Zillow and Compass, but. Uh, but yeah, Redfin was up at seven and a quarter about a week ago, not even a week ago, like five, six days ago. It, it was, it's gone from 725 to 557. It's been down like 20%. So, I, I'm, I'm not speculating on the stock price, but I, I'm going to make a prediction. Um, and again, not original. This was, this was thrown out by a friend of mine who, uh, after thinking about it, I agree with. I'm not going to put his name out there. Um, but I, I agree with him that I, I bet Redfin is purchased in the next 12 months. Well, if anything, I hope that uh, just leads to better agents because, as I said, it's way too easy to become an agent. There's way too many crappy agents out there, and I think, yeah, I, I think most people would be happy paying two percent, three percent if they knew they were getting their money's worth and they were doing a good job. And the, I think the problem is right now is just the the feeling that there's too many agents out there who don't aren't worth it, aren't doing doing their fair amount. But if you want to talk about the winners, um, so upon the news of the uh the, the settlement actually home builder stocks rose anywhere from one to two percent so lenar went up to 2.4 percent hold group went up 1.1 toll brothers went up 1.8 which is a good um little segue into talking about housing starts so there was the announcement uh they, they announced the new housing starts statistics yesterday and housing starts rose by the most amount since last may after a steep decline so single family housing starts surged 11.6% in February and single family building permits increased 1%. So on the surface, this would seem like great news for housing prices and the housing market in general. But uh, let's start with AJ. What do you, what do you think about uh, the news of housing, housing starts? So I think housing has been a big issue 
for a while. And one of the biggest trends that we saw in 2023, which this stuff interests us because it greatly affects the storage industry, but the housing market shut down for lack of a better word um, in 2023. We saw sales starts numbers that went back to like 2008 numbers, right? Um, but we didn't see a corresponding drop in prices. Now that's important to understand housing starts because when, when we think about housing starts, right, we're talking about new builds. So how many units are coming on to the market? Now, one of the most important things is not just right now, but the past. So over the past, um, the United States has been so far below anything that is even, I mean, you know, historically speaking, the United States, if you go all the way back to the like 70s, the United States on average has put over a million housing units out. Like this is like clockwork. After 2008, we drop below that million number and we dropped all the way below 600,000 and we didn't hit uh, over a million until just 2021. So remember that prior that had only happened a few years, including a recession in 82, a really short moment in 91, and then in 74 and 75. Now that is also though on dramatically less population uh, not nearly as many loans available uh, and uh, everything else that makes it easier to buy, move, everything that we have in society. So we are at lifetime lows. And those lows were low by like two plus million every single year. So the combined shortage is tens of millions of houses. And uh, that's... Uh, why we have not seen a drop in prices, right? Because we're so short and for so long, we've been running negative. So the housing starts is a big issue if we're looking at pr pricing. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it, you, supply and demand, we just don't have supply in the United States. Um, the amount of cash buyers is wild. It's, there's just not supply. So if we want to see or wonder how the housing market will do, Housing starts is a really, really important one. Um, I'm going to share my screen here so we can look at this. I'll explain it to anybody that's not um, watching this on YouTube. When we look at the um, housing starts, we can see a few things. And that's that we hit when interest rates really um, went up. We had a few things that happened is housing starts went down in 2023. We hit um, a really big low here. Now, with the latest news and what we've seen in 2024 is that we've actually gone up in January of 2024 uh, from our previous low. So this is a really important metric that we look at, and that's the year over year, right? So we are up higher than was anticipated, but we're up even higher than last year. Okay, so if you can kind of see here in uh, this chart, everybody we're looking, it's if you look at existing home sales and how they've been adjusted, we can see kind of a bottom that we had in 2023, and that was just below, um, we're, well, in between 200 and 250,000 units on home sales. And this January, we bottomed out higher than that a little. Um, but the new numbers coming in on home sales and uh, home starts actually um, have surprised a lot of people. And we beat a lot of our, uh, a lot of the estimates that people thought we were going to hit. So we hit, home starts and home sales up were quite a bit. In fact, we thought home sales would be up seven. We didn't think, 
but it was guidance that they'd be up 7% and they were up over 10%. Um, so we're seeing a better rebound, uh, rebound in spring, even though interest rates haven't changed. So there's still pent up demand. Even with such high interest rates and high prices, we're actually seeing home starts and home sales rise. Um, and I don't think that's a good thing if we're talking about like the Fed wanting to <laughs> drop interest rates um, and the effect it'll have the housing market. But I think that this year will be a stronger housing market than last year. For sure, it's looking like it already, even without major adjustments in the 30 year. Now, the 30 year mortgage, it may be down a little versus some periods in 2023, but we're not talking about anything significant to open up a wide array of buyers. AJ, is, is, isn't the housing starts like a lagging indicator? I mean, is that like housing builders don't just jump in like with a whim? Like they've got, they, they know what's going on in the market, they've, they've got their, their studies and they know what they're doing. So, I mean, does, does, is this a sign that they see that we're kind of past the, I was going to say the bottom, but we haven't really <laughs> gone up. Like, is this the, the, the end of the slowdown and they're predicting basically from their analysis that it's for the next five or, because obviously it takes a while to build these things. In the next five or 10 years, it's just going to be, there's going to be an increased demand. That's why they're building now. So I think we're actually just seeing projects get, finished up, wrapped up, and uh, because it is a lagging indicator. And it wouldn't surprise me if there was a lot of things that were put on hold last year and ones that said, hey, we have price stability, let's get these off. But I can tell you that home builders are not out throwing up spec homes. This is not something that they are, um, they're nervous. They're really nervous. And I, I've talked to several builders that the amount of inventory they have on hand uh, is the lowest they've ever had. And they don't want a surge in homes hitting the market or, or them putting out homes because they just don't know if it's going to change. So there's demand. So they're, they are building, but the amount of land that I've seen and what we've seen them buy and the amount of land, they've really pulled back on that. Now, I think it may be more than 2023 and they're more willing to put houses out but I, I don't think we have a home builder rush now to say, oh, we're going to pick it back up like it was in 2021 or anything else. So it's a lagging indicator that I think 2023 was the bottom, but I don't think we're going to see a quick turnaround. And definitely not a lot of units are on the horizon to be put out onto the market. Nothing that would help us with the housing crisis, even close. We'll, we will be millions of houses short probably over the next two years. Yeah, if, if you look at the first chart that that AJ put up, and it's funny, I was looking at that chart before we we started recording today, um, and I'm not going to bring it back up, but basically what it showed was housing starts uh, between uh, single family and multifamily, and and what we see is uh, in the single family space, um, we're basically back um, uh, higher than we were before COVID. Um, but not much. We're basically, we, we, we dropped to a low in January, 2009. Um, we were basically building nothing from 2009 through 2018. And then we started to bump up around 2019, 2020. Um, and so we're basically back to where we were then. We were not building as, as AJ pointed out enough houses back in 2019, 2020 to keep up with the demand that, that grew over the previous 10 years. And so even though we are a good bit higher than we've been over the last decade in terms of housing starts, uh, we're still far, far below where we need to be. Uh, to answer your question, Mauricio, the number I've always heard is uh, from housing start to completion for single family, we're around five to six months. Then you look at the multifamily side. On the multifamily side, we're basically back again where we were um, back around 2019. Um, and, but, but housing starts in the multifamily side is generally 17 to 18 months and permits are picking up, but that's another three to six months. So we're basically two years out from seeing any real excess, uh, supply on the multifamily side. So I think in terms of units in general, we're still going to be far, far below where we need to be. And I think we're going to be lower or we're going to be in a worse position even than we were in 2019 going into 2020. Um, you look a couple of years from now when multifamily, like all those units start coming online, presumably single family picks up. And I think in a couple of years, uh, we may be picking up speed in terms of supply. But I, I think the next two years is, is 
basically we're, we're still well underbuilt and we're not going to see uh, any price movement based on what's coming online. So, so what's your guys, this is, a, I'm, I'm going to go into a little dissertation here, but like, so what does that mean for you guys? Okay. So we're in a huge, you know, shortage of housing and this, that, the other, I mean, is the conclusion there that, that just, that the only thing that can mean that's like over the next 10 years, there's just going to be upward pressure on prices and prices are going to go up. Is that kind of like the idea of the conclusion? Well, I, I don't think these starts are, are really helping anything at all. Cause it, even if anything, COVID kind of exasperated the, the cost to build a little bit too. So more so than ever, like these, these houses that are getting built, they're not helping the affordability. Like they're just, they're, they're supplying the higher end houses. No one can build these 400,000, what's the median price of a house right now? 400 and, and change. Like no one can build a house that's and make money, build a $400,000 house right now. You're having to build those 800 million plus houses just to, just to, to make money. So I don't think even if we see housing starts take off, affordability is still, still going to be a huge issue. Yeah. And I just think there's an alternative. I mean, you know, as somebody who, you know, I was born in a third world country. I mean, I just got back from visiting down in Chile in South America. And, and what happens there is that is an issue of, you know, affordability. There's only, at some point, there's only so much, there's only so much prices that the population can absorb. I mean, it's the, the prices can't just keep going up. I understand that we're in a shortage, shortage and I get that. But at some point, people just can't afford. They don't make enough. They can't qualify enough for a loan. They just can't do it. And so they're forced to do other things like, you know, combine rooming with each other. And now you suddenly have, th instead of having th three different people with three different houses, you have three people living in one house. And so even though you, you should have three houses sold, you have one. Or you have people, you know, in, 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 in where I'm from, in Chile, like it's not it, not un uncommon to have people stay with, with their parents until they literally get married. Or they, you could be 30 years old making money. You just don't make enough money to go buy your own place or even rent your own. Forget rent, buy your own place, not rent your own place. And so it, I just want to caution people that just doesn't, just because you see, you know, housing shortage, that doesn't automatically mean you're going to see this like dramatic price increase because people will adapt. If they can't pay the rent or they can't pay the mortgage, they're going to end up moving back to the basement with their parents. They're going to stay at home instead of leaving home at 18 and 19. They're going to be with their parents till 30, 35 and, and, and maybe they're renting a room or maybe there's like the four of us get together and rent a house. And it's like, it doesn't mean you're going to actually have to, you know, push those prices up because there's only so much the, the populace can, can bear. Well, the, in the United States, they move. So the thing about it is we talk about housing starts, things like that. But, you know, for I know we have people in Canada, you know, people in Europe will listen to this stuff. But the pricing discrepancy in the United States is wild when it comes to housing. I mean, I mean, basically, the United States is not only huge, but it's a combination of almost other their countries. Right. The 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 real estate landscape in California is nothing like the South Midwest or in other places. So in the United States, this has been one of the major drivers of mobility. And if you look at an individual who's in their 30s or getting married, want to have kids and they can't afford in Southern California, they're going to Texas because it's a fraction of the price. And so the problem that you have is the lower income people that do not have the option to move. They have to pay rents, right? This pricing instability is really bad because builders can't build price points that allow uh, you to have affordable housing and them still make money. And so they only build bigger houses and they build to people that can buy and afford them while the lower end houses aren't getting built at all. And that's what we're seeing a lot. We're not seeing, nobody's building affordable housing. Um, it's the, first of all, it's too sensitive, right? They learned that in 2008 and they learned, you know, it, it, so it's a concentration of product, but it's also, you have a lack of inventory that's keeping stability high. So when you're talking about housing, there's three different markets. There's the upper market, the middle and the bottom. Nothing that we're talking about is going to help the bottom at all. Like there's, there's no good options coming out for the lower end of the market and less homes means that they don't get options because you need the people that have starter homes to be able to move up. So that's how it works. Right. And then somebody that wants a starter home should go back and buy down, but that market is just, it's, it's suffering and it's been bad for so long. Even the housing permits that we look at, over the last three months, housing permits, they've started to go up, 
but they're still way behind what they were over the last two years. So housing permits have pulled back tremendously in the last eight months. So th what does that tell us about moving forward housing starts? Well, obviously they're, they're not gonna keep up if permits are getting, you know, they're not being pu uh, pulled nearly as much. So I think that it means a couple things, higher housing prices, yes, more mobility though in the United States. I think it's now more of a thing where if I want to afford a home, I can't afford it at 800,000. I got to move somewhere where I can buy a house for 200,000 and I can get a job there and I can work. And I think that's going to be a reoccurring continual theme in the United States. And keep in mind that, that we're only talking about one, one economic force here. Um, and when you, when you look at housing, I mean, Kyle will appreciate this as the only guy here with a physics degree um, in, in physics. When you do it, when you solve an equation on forces, you have to look at all the forces acting on an object and, and you add them all up in different directions. And that determines what, 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 which direction that object moves. And it's the same thing in the housing market. We have lots of different forces that are acting on housing value. Stop laughing at me, Mauricio. Um, We've got lots of different forces that that act on on housing values, and supply is one of those forces. Demand is another force, and and um, there there are a whole bunch of forces. Rates are, are another force, and population movement is a force. And you have to take all of these forces into account to determine if values are going to go up, go down, or stay the same. And it it's just one data point. The fact that there is a, a, a below uh, the necessary amount of housing is one force that is going to push values in the upwards direction. Doesn't necessarily mean they're going to go that way if they're, if they're bigger forces pushing downward, um, but it is a, an important one. Maybe you brought up a really good point there, actually. Wait, 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 wait. I, got, I, can't, I can't. I mean, you know, somebody who used to love chemistry when I was a kid, I mean, it's just like chemistry, right? You get all these things coming together into one big thing and suddenly you have a big explosion everything explodes. And, and so it's a very clear analogy with chemistry. So chemistry is what it's all about. So anyway, I just wanted to respond with that before you throw your physics uh, out of nowhere. N no. So I, I was actually, I want to go back to AJ and he threw one thing out there that stuck with me and I hadn't thought of it till right now about there, there probably is some hope coming down the pike eventually here with um, just demographics and generational demographics. And because we have the millennial, the millennial population right now, the eldest millennials are now in their 40s and that's going down through their 30s. They're the largest population after the baby boomers. And so eventually we're getting to the point where they're getting, making enough money that they can afford these more expensive houses. So as that, as that part of the population shifts upwards in the home buying process, the demographics below aren't nearly as big. So hopefully you would think that the housing supply will lean into the, the current millennials making more money and the shift of the, the lower demographics being able to scoop up those lower priced houses. Is that a, is that a physics analogy or is it more of a biological analysis? <laughs> uh, I'm going to point out that I didn't hear a word that Kyle said because he started the whole thing with down the pike. And so uh, uh, that that I, I I had to jump on Google real quick and see if that was the the, the correct saying. And to to Kyle's credit, it absolutely is. And so I, I didn't hear a thing that he said, but I, I will say that down the pike, which is short for down the turnpike, which turnpike goes right by my house, Jay. So there you go. So I thought that was a good. That's so yeah. So look, there's the the millennials or the, the they're sometimes called the echo boomers, right? So I mean, yeah, there's a lot more millennials. If you think of it as a wall, like this particular wall, this particular generation, it's just a higher, higher number. And then the wall behind, which is what what comes after the Gen Zers or the 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 lazy people, what are they called? They're they're the, whatever these I, I don't are. even care after millennials. They're just the youngins like, to me. They all look so young. But if that if, and I'd like to look at there's there's always great graphs that show kind of the waves. And so if, if the other wave is like 70% of the millennials, and I'm just making that up, but like if it is a lower amount. Then maybe that's what's going to save us, Kyle. It's uh, it, it's just a lower demand, you know, 10, 20 years from now. There you go. You, you heard it. You heard it here first. That's our theory. Let's come up with a name for this, and we should we should coin it. We'll, the we'll... pike, the pike, the pike theory. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What, what, what time? We're we're getting pretty long here. Do, do we have time for a third topic? Uh, I, I, let me let me do a one minute. 
All right, Jay. So just so obviously we got. Wait, wait. Let me get the stopwatch. Let me get the stopwatch because you know what, Jay's minute is like my something. My wife's minute when she's talking to my kids is like a twenty minute, one minute. So let's do a stopwatch. Here. Oh, see, it's funny because with my wife, it's the other. It's the other direction. I know you were going to make a sex joke there. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so we did want to touch on briefly. We do when this comes out on Wednesday, we do have a Fed meeting at the same time. Um, not a lot to talk about, as Jay mentioned before. It's expected they're just going to pretty pretty much a shoe, and they're going to hold where we are. But the one thing that is happening is not every meeting they do this uh, dot plot where. Basically, each of the uh, um, each of the the people, the the Fed members, do their little their little predictions. So, Jay, why don't you talk about that? I, you just talked about it. <laughs> you, took, you took my entire segment. I, I saved you the time. You only had one minute, so I gave you the the the, the pre preface. Jeez, literally, that was all wait, I was doing. Wait, 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 wait. No, honestly, let me let me wait, wait. Let me start the timer before you get going. Let's go one minute timer. Go. Literally, that's all I was going to mention. So uh, basically, we have the the Fed meeting coming out today. So we're recording this Tuesday night. Uh, the Fed's going to announce rate hikes tomorrow on Wednesday when this comes out. Ninety nine percent chance the market is factoring in of no rate hike. I think that's fairly safe to say. In fact, I, I don't even. We can go into this next week or the following week. But um, again, if you look at PC, core PCE, which is the, the the preferred inflation measure from the government, uh, we're under three percent, and so I, I don't think the Fed's too worried about inflation right now. But um, we had been talking about three or seven, whatever metric you want to look at, uh, rate cuts this year, and. I think that seven is is out the window. The three may be out the window. Uh, it'll be interesting to see tomorrow when they release that dot that dot plot, which basically indicates uh, the folks on the FOMC committee um, how many rate cuts they think there's going to be this year and how big. Um, and so we'll get an idea from them if uh, if they think we're we're still in for three rate cuts or, or fewer. Um, but as of now, it, it's June before we see any significant chance of the market. The market sees any significant chance of a, of a cut being priced in. Well, actually, so it's not going to take much for the Fed to come off that three because the three, when you look at three, it's actually just the median of all of them. So they that that's where they get the three. And if you dive into all the different me members, all it takes is two of those members to change their mind. So if if two of those members change their mind. Then, then we could go down to all of a sudden two. I got that. So Mauricio took off his glasses. Kyle's camera is doing weird things. What, what's going on with this episode? My my alarm is ringing, but it's so slow. Like I'm trying to get the alarm here. But <laughs> yeah, anyway. Mauricio just keep putting his phone up to his ear. Like it's just me and Jay now. No, my my camera has my camera has gestures so like if you gesture at the camera it does stuff so sometimes when i talk with my hands my camera does weird shit throwing up gang signs yeah exactly uh all right let's let's wrap this up boys um i have a uh i have a quick top 10 um to mariso chagrin but i just wanted to make the uh make the point before the news keeps talking about these six percent uh commissions but there's actually not many of these places are actually doing 6%. So there's only seven states. So I'll do the top seven states that actually have a 6% commission average or more. And that's Iowa, Indiana, Maine, North Dakota, South Dakota, Texas, and Vermont. Um, and then it goes, their average is less than. But if you look at the bottom, there's actually New York. Their average uh, real estate commission is only 4.66. Rhode Island, 4.86. And then it gets closer to five. Alaska, Nevada, California, they're all right around 5% as their average commission. So 6% that everyone, all the news is talking about, that's uh, that's not even the norm uh, for people to get. Uh, all right. So let's uh, let's wrap this up. I got one question for you guys. I was sitting in my shower today and I got a really nice you shower. Were sitting in your, you shower sitting down? No, nah, actually, no, I was standing. I do have a seat in my shower, but I don't, I don't use it. Um, but it made me think of this question. What is one thing that you guys have purchased that would be considered an un unnecessary luxury, but you would argue is worth every penny you spent? And I, I'll, I'll start by giving you an example. So my shower, I have a smart shower. So basically, when I'm done my workout in my basement, I can pull up my phone and I can start my shower. And so my shower goes all the way up to my preferred temperature, which for me, it's 109. For my wife, it's 117 or something. Um, but it goes up to 109 
And then by the time I get up to my shower, it has already shut itself off. It maintains that temperature. I walk in, I turn it on, and it's the perfect temperature every time. No more of this like fiddling with the knob, trying to figure out the best temperature. Or once I get in there, I got to reach in and try not to get my hand wet, turning the, the shower on. None of that crap anymore. And it was expensive, but to me, it was worth every penny. And I love it. I don't know. I just turned my shower. I know exactly what it, where, where to dial it. And it's just the same temperature every time. Like, why would I need to pay anything to do that? I just literally go in there and I turn it on and I like, it's around here and it's perfect. That's my point, Mauricio. I, I used to do that. And I had had that argument until I actually, I had it. I have it now. And I would say it's worth every penny I spent. So Mauricio, what do you got? What, what's something that, uh, that you got that you've spent a lot of money on that you would, uh, that you would argue is worth every penny? It's probably my, uh, my wine addiction. I mean, you know, I, I have no problem, especially for my birthday and special occasions. Not, not, every, not, not every day, but not like Jay who does it every day when he's not buying at Costco. But, you know, if I'll spend two $300 on a bottle of wine. I think it's worth it. People will say that's the biggest waste of money. They can't tell the difference. On well, your Corbin, right? How much is your Corbin or your Corvin or whatever it is? I'm not, you know, if I was, I would never, by the way, I would, not, not to knock Corbin because I like him. I would never use Corbin on a, like a legit, like I wouldn't spend $300 on a bottle of wine and Corbin it. Why? Because I'm pumping whatever gases are in there. I, I'm, I'm just afraid it's changing. The, it, it does change the taste slightly. And if I'm spending $300 on a bottle of wine, I want to aerate that sucker and get it decanted for you know three or four hours, and then I'm drinking a nicely decanted bottle of red, worth every penny. All right, there you go, AJ. What's something you've bought? Um, I guess I'll have to go with Ernie. <laughs> worth every penny. <laughs> worth, worth every penny. <laughs> Little different perspective, eh? Mine was like a thousand bucks. His is what three million. So okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're worth every penny. <laughs> All right. All right, Jay, you got something in between those two numbers? Um, so I, I can throw out the thing. I think we talked about this a week or two ago. I mean, I, I'll, I can pick something else if, if we don't want to talk about it again. But my my awesome ice maker, basically the 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 ice maker that makes the perfect crunchy ice, the little ice. And AJ know AJ and I talked about this. We 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 know um, if you've had good ice, you can't go back. Yep. And so it, it was, it was a splurge and, but, but it's good ice. Fair enough. I went through a time where I almost bought one of those ice things that made the perfect spheres, like perfectly clear sphere ice balls for like when you, you know, mix your bourbon in, but I decided it wasn't worth it. I, I have a cheap one of those that like is just uh, the, the molded plastic that I bought at Total Wine as, as a, as a, uh, uh, one of those, uh, white elephant gifts that I never gave away. So I occasionally use it. Yeah, I, I use those, but I wasn't willing to spend the 600 bucks or whatever. Some, some of them are like 1500. Yeah. Or you can get the ice press or whatever. All right. That's a, that's a wide range of answers there from thousand to 3 million. Um, all right, let's wrap this up. Uh, I'm not going to start with Jay cause he's never got anything. Mauricio, I have a feeling what your plug's going to be this week. What do we got? Legal strategies for everyone. The book has been released. It's out. If you guys buy a copy and uh, just DM me, I've got uh, something special for you. So just uh, get a copy. Legal strategies for everyone. Give me a DM. I got a special webinar I'm putting out on uh, asset protection 101. It's probably going to be like a four hour webinar. It's going to be a Q and A. Ask whatever questions you have. Stop spending thousands of dollars on real on asset protection course. I'm going to do one for free. But you got to buy a book. That's your price of admission. We, next week, Mauricio, why don't we do a segment on asset protection and I will, because I want some free advice. I want to tell you what I have going on and you tell me how good my asset protection is and you can critique it. I, not only would I love that, I would love for each of you to send out a specific strategy and I'll just poke holes in it. Like I won't tell you whether it's good or bad. I'll just tell you why it doesn't work. That'd be great. All right. AJ, what do you got to plug? So um, I'm going to be doing some meetups in Texas, Arizona, Nashville over the coming months. We had uh, our last one in Dallas. We had an awesome crew, 7,500 people met up. So everybody go jump on to either my Instagram or go make sure you're signed up for our, our newsletter. So that way I can meet up with you when we're jumping around to these different spots. We try to hit up once one spot a month. So go make sure on Instagram you're following us or the newsletter so you can see where our meetups are. Awesome. Jay, you got one? Um, well, I actually had somebody that reached out to me after last week's episode and said, I, I heard about uh, this this fund that you guys are doing. You mentioned uh, on, on the show, and I want to get more information about the fund. Um, so we, we basically got an investor who heard my, my pitch. So I think I have to start taking these things a little bit more seriously. 
So um, I'm going to, I'm going to do that one more time. We've got a couple spots left. I think literally three spots left for, for the fund before we close it up probably by the end of the week. So anybody that's listening to this, that's looking for a, a good investment, uh, consistent cash flow and uh, uh, lower risk than traditional um, uh, syndications or funds open to accredited investors only, no guarantees, past performance is not indicative of future performance. What am I missing there, Mauricio? Just that they're world-class prepared documents for the investors. And with amazing documents that will- Yeah, please, please, please three people reach out to Jay and, and fund that because Jay doesn't want to have to do any actual work on this. Like they, you know, he doesn't want to actually make any phone calls or do any stuff. He just wants to send out some emails. So let me do this. If you buy a pack of 10 of these books, I will answer any questions about the documents of, uh, of Jay Scott's and syndication. <laughs> I will walk you through those documents, but you got to buy 10 books. I'll send you the documents for free if you just want to read them. Anybody wants to read them? <laughs> well, you need you need an SEC attorney to tell you like the legalese on these things. Jeez, I don't I don't even read them. Uh, I th- so that's that's one thing I will give Mauricio and his partner Bethany tremendous credit for. I I see lots of legal documents in my life, and I mean everything has to be legalese to some degree. Um, but I can understand the documents, and if I can understand the documents, like. That means our investors can can understand the difference. Just go through one of these things, though, and, and count how many times you see the word whereas. And uh, you never you never see that word outside of a legal document. So, so, so you don't use heretofore? Yeah, exactly. In, in normal conversation. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to, once again, I'm going to plug my wife, uh, Badass Investor. Check her out on Instagram and uh, YouTube. Shout out to the, the, the few people who actually did DM my wife on instagram and say uh don't buy any more horses they all caveated said that their husband that her husband said don't do that so it wasn't just a bunch of random people who just said don't buy any more houses horses and one actually did do it before she had listened to the episode so that was a pretty funny interaction between us where she's like some random guy just told me not to buy any more houses horses (laughs) that that was great but uh so go check her out uh, and feel free to dm her again say don't buy any more horses all right, guys. I had some fun. I uh, hope you enjoyed it as well. Hope the listeners enjoyed it. Uh, we're knocking on number 40. I don't know if that's a milestone next week, but uh, yeah, we're happy to make it. But uh, my drink's gone. Time to uh, hit the head. I will see you next Tuesday. Later. See you guys. <laughs>